Hello everyone, and welcome back to another CK3 guide. I, Lord Foreman, am going to be covering today how diplomacy is actually a viable strategy after the Royal Court expansion. And we'll go into why, but um, suffice to say, I've taken this guy here, of you, or however you say it, and easily turned him into the full-on Emperor of Tibet. Just quick show you the proof of this strategy before I get into how to do it. Empire of Tibet, all run from a single county. I am, um, there we go. All I own is the county and the barony here. No other, no other land I directly control. It's all controlled through vassals. It was all gained mostly peacefully. In total of this game, I fought 18 wars, half of which or more were defensive wars. I fought, personally, I launched five offensive wars, one subjugate kingdom to get land to get Tibet, and that was really late war. And the other three of them were involved in a succession, and one was to subjugate a single province count, a uh, single province duke who hated me because I owned counties. So, it is quite possible to play diplomatic. You can play it there, you can play it under the Abbasids, you can play it anybody, really. You just have to know how to do it. So let's get into how you do it. So, starting is this guy, okay? Tibet is actually an easier area to do it than some other areas because you mostly all speak the Tibetan language, but is viable anywhere else. You just have to keep an eye on your relations with people and how, and how you manage it. So this guy right here, if we look at him, negative 90 to vassalage, right? We can vassalize this guy very easily. In fact, once I vassalized this guy in my big run, I managed to vassalize all of this within two years. So first thing to note is if you can, you can give them a religious exemption, which is plus 60. It is huge. It overcomes different faith and not right foliage, usually with ease. So now we're down to 30. Okay. When you try it on people who are completely hostile to you, um, uh, yes, well, not completely hostile, but semi-hostile towards you. Like this guy, negative 99, religious exemption 39, manageable. If we go to, let me see if I can find somebody here. Now, ignore the negative 500 due to realm is remote for yours, okay? So imagine that's only 100 something. So now if we take that away, we're only at 70. 70 is vassalizable. It, it takes work, it takes effort, it takes time, and you won't have any time to go down the martial trees or fight. How we get around this? The big one that's holding us back in this case would be cultural acceptance, which is negative 30. If we get cultural acceptance to zero, then we're only 40 away. And 40 can be overcome with ease. So the first thing to note is because of the new cultural mechanics, every culture has an acceptance rate. As it goes up, the people in it will like you a bit more. Okay, so this culture right here, 40% accepted. Cultural acceptance, negative four. 50% less because we speak Tibetan, otherwise it would be eight. Fair. Now, if we look down here at these guys, different culture, 30. So that tells you what the difference between a zero acceptance rate and a 40 acceptance rate is. You get to 100 acceptance, there's no penalty, which tells you as you expand, you want to be ideally using your steward here to promote different cultures. So if we, for example, promoted cultural acceptance here, and then we look at this culture here, which is definitely not ours, we'd see that this is now going up, which means the steward is probably one of the most important people you'll have in this run. I didn't actually need to because Tibet, cultural penalties, you're close to most of them. It builds up quickly. I had to do it in two cases where I was interacting with the Chinese to the north because they are a completely different foreign culture with a very low acceptance rate. But it works. So how do we overcome this penalty here? Okay. Well, first thing is, if we can, we want to start swaying them. I already started swaying this guy. I haven't managed to succeed, but if we got him positive, that would get us a, get him a long way towards actually liking us. 
see if we, do we have anybody who borders us that we actually like us at the moment? We don't have enough gold to bribe a lot. Well, most of these people. So, um, so anybody I can bribe at the moment? Probably not. Yeah, not worth worrying about. Suffice to say, Sway will get the opinion of the person positive. Because if we look at this right here, negative eight for 25. So you flip that the other way, it can be like plus 10, 20 right there. That gets us really close to vassalization. Now, there are a couple other things you need to know to do this. One thing is, if you have a high grandeur of your court and you get above what your court, your court grandeur expected level is. Okay? Expected level is very useful when you're small. If we are build up, and I'll I try to remember to show you the Tibetan Empire, um, being above your expected grandeur gives you a positive opinion with the people. Um, it's not huge. Um, it's like 10. But it helps just a little bit to get their opinion higher than you can get just for default. Sometimes I don't even need to sway people. But there are specifically two lifestyles that were, are going to help immensely with this. One, the first one here is open-minded. Different cultural acceptance plus 15. It is very, very useful. And then right beneath it is apostate. Different faith opinion plus 15. These two right here overcome a lot of the penalties that you would have to people of a different religion or culture having a positive opinion of you. Plus 30 or so is really useful. But the big gem of all of this comes from True Ruler. Offer vassalization acceptance plus 25. It's huge. As you can imagine, as soon as we get that one right here, plus 25, we're only five away. Proof opinion, just like that, I've got a vassal. Okay? Now, some people would say, well, forewind, you've got people that have normal taxes, low levy, and religiously protected. Aren't they going to revolt? Well, not necessarily. And this is where knowing how to do feudal contract negotiation really comes in. Okay? So I have taken over Tibet here. Single province, all of this. I even went Thervada and everybody else is Nangchos, which means I had a religious penalty against these people the whole time. Just take that into account. It's even easier if you're of the same religion. So, for example, if... France collapses like it has done here, it would be pretty easy for me to take Kingdom of France. Um, although I'd probably, well, actually they're Cathar in this case, um, and reconsolidate France just through vassalization pretty efficiently. See, I'd target this guy here, but he's a <laughs> he's, he's Muslim. So yeah, you could do it. Anywhere you've had collapses. Russia's a great place. Tibet is a great place. India is amazing. Anywhere down here is amazing. Over here, it's amazing too. Because culture and religion don't matter as much anymore. So, back to contract negotiation. This guy here, I've taken over. And when I had him initially, because I gave him the religious exemption, this is what the setup was. Feudal tax is normal. Religious rights protected. Okay? So, what you do is if you lower the feudal taxes, which you'll notice I don't get much tax from him. Put it to low. I get no tax from him. Already not getting many levies. It allows me to change the religious rights. Turn it off immediately. And because I've improved his opinion to get him to join my empire, I have a very high usual um, relation with them. I can usually immediately persuade them. I did it with this guy to join my religion because I usually have 100% opinion with them. Now, the reason this guy didn't convert when I demanded it is because he doesn't have a seat on my council. Obviously, easy thing to do would be put him on my council. Um, all these people I took over here, I've done the same thing with. If we look at the modified feudal contract on most of them, oh, I guess I've patched them up over time. Sorry, bad example. Here we go. Low feudal, low levies. This guy was not Buddhist when I took him over. He was still part of this um, oh, it's actually almost entirely gone now. Oh, it was of a different faith. It was of the starting one, the Bond faith or whatever. Took a while. It was of this one here. Um, 
managed to get him on our side pretty easily, expanded rapidly, so long as I made sure to get their religion on my side, because I had gotten the cultural acceptance high, they didn't have a cultural penalty towards me. The only penalty they really ever had to staying loyal was religious. So this meant the realm is very stable. Now, to be fair, I am in Tibet, so most of my levies are coming from religious buildings, but you can do it as other nations. So let's jump to another one. If you're still not convinced of this strategy, I'll show you this one. This is 1066 start. I am the Fatimids. Okay. I am actually Shia. Uh, not Sunni, which means these guys hate me, right? Also, this guy over here really hates me because I am. He's hostile towards me. This guy right here, <clears throat> because I'm a different faith, going to be pretty difficult to get him as a vassal. It's actually easier to go south towards the Coptics and get this guy as a vassal. Offer him religious exemptions, that's 70. That's manageable. I get the cultural acceptance down. Now I'm down to uh, 45, right? Yeah, 45-ish. And then I get, um, I improve the opinion, which gets me positive. And I reduce the cultural, I got the cultural acceptance down, everything else. The different faith, we're going to, um, Help balance some of that by going down learning, getting uh, open-minded and apostate, which will help them like me a bit more. Now, it would be easier if I controlled, say, the kingdom of Nubia, but it is very possible to get this guy as a vassal, just from what I'm saying already. You reduce the cultural acceptance. We already have true ruler, which is annoying. We improve the opinion. We get the different faith penalty, hopefully down. And if we build up our military strength and grandeur, we can get him as a subject. Um, ideally, even if I can't get this guy as a subject, because of the early game succession rules, um, he's not a good example. Is there anybody around here who's a good example? Partition inheritance, right? When you die, your lands are divided evenly, right? This guy has one duchy. Um as his title, but when he if he died with multiple sons, now you'd split it out. So I'd be even stronger than them. They would be weaker. I wait for the opportune moment when the realm splinters, then I stride in and I vassalize them all. It's what I did in the Tibet run. It's what I did in an Avasad run. It's what I did in the Russian run. So long as they don't have primogeniture, as in the Byzantines, um, it's, or they disinherit him like a player. Um, AIs don't tend to do it. Very easy to stride into a realm that's broken up and vassalize your way through it. It makes the entire game feel different and play different. Um, I didn't have to fight offensive wars other than one to take over a kingdom. Um, so long as you start as a rank higher than people. So if you start as a duke surrounded by um, counts, you can do the strategy. Slightly harder because you're probably not that much stronger than as soon as you get a kingdom. We know how easy it is to vassalize people of your own culture and religion. Now with the royal court, because you can get rid of the culture penalty and you can control the religious penalty to a large degree. You can now vassalize people of a different culture or religion. It is a totally viable strategy to have a single county and rule an immense empire and have it be amazingly stable like I was doing in the Tibet game. Go ahead, try it out if you don't believe me. Hopefully it doesn't get patched, but it is an amazing strategy. Changes the entire way you can play the game. You no longer have to be a military dictator to rule. Now you can actually feel like a lord with diplomacy. It is so fun. And the court grandeur stuff just helps in terms of getting opinions and everything up. Um, it's really cool. Royal court, the actual royal court part, not as amazing for this strategy, but the whole new cultural thing, the fact that you can get cultural penalties down to zero if you work at it means that vassalizing is once again a viable strategy in a paradox game. Thank you guys all for watching this guide. If you do have any more questions or comments, please leave them below. Obviously the guide may change if paradox patches and changes the numbers. If not, it should still be viable most of the time. See you guys all another time. Bye for now.